Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video in the Spigot series. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to SQL databases with the Spigot plugins. Okay guys, the time has come. I'm finally going to show you guys how to use SQL databases with your Spigot plugins, how to connect to them in your plugins, and how to uh, do stuff with the database to store data that you would normally store within either your plugin in memory or in a file or something like that. And if you want to support this channel, you can do that in many ways. You can hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. If you want to support me financially to help me make more videos, you can hit the join button or the applause button. And that's it. Let's get started here and make sure to check the description below for the links for this episode so you can uh, see what other information I have for you. Uh, so yeah, SQL databases with Spigot, the best thing since cheese. All right, so why do we want to use an SQL database? What is the use case? So obviously, whenever you have a plugin, you want to store data. And that can be with uh, you know many different means. But normally, the most basic way is to store it in variables. So in objects or data structures, which are objects. So for example, if you're trying to store certain information on each player on your server, then you can make a hash map. The key of the hash map would be the player or their UUID. And the value of the hash map would be the data that you want to keep on each player. So that's all in a memory, and the thing about memory is that it's not persistent. It's going to be wiped whenever the server restarts or reloads. And so if you want to make your data persistent, you could use a database. That's really why you would want to use a database, all right? So what does it mean to be persistent, though? Let me make that clear. So again, persistent data means that it will exist even when our plugins are reloaded or the server's restarted. So hopefully you know this. Whenever you store stuff in variables or in objects or anything like that, it's all going to be stored in your computer's memory, your computer's RAM or virtual memory. And whenever you have a program running, that memory is stored there, but it won't always be stored there. So whenever the program is stopped or is restarted, that memory gets deallocated. So that's with any program like C programs, C++ programs, Java programs. You can't just store stuff in memory permanently. So the data will be lost and that's not very fun because a lot of the time you want your data to be persistent because you want to come back to it at a later point. Computers and programs will not be very useful if you cannot store data permanently. All right. So databases are not the only solution though. You may have seen my other videos or have tried some of these other things to make data persistent. So this includes databases, obviously. So there's SQL and NoSQL databases. So you have MongoDB, which is a NoSQL solution. And I have a video on that. I'm going to redo it eventually, but um, you can look into that if you wish. And then you have files. So with files, there's a lot of possibilities. So you have JSON files to store JSON data. You have YML files, which are directly supported by this Pigot API. And the cool thing about files in general is that you don't need to follow any standard. If you don't want to use JSON or YML, you can define your own standard. You could store, you can make your own arbitrary text file with its own arbitrary extension, like .poop or something like that, and then you could store the data however you want to, as long as you know how to retrieve that data later on. And you could also just store it as, you know, bits directly and bytes directly, um, but that's kind of complicated. So um, usually the reason you would want to use databases over files is because databases are sometimes easier to work with, especially when you have large amounts of data. And also they can be faster because of the data structures that databases use behind the scenes. So at the end of the day, databases do use files behind the scenes to store the data. Um, that's what makes it persistent. But whenever a database is running, the data is also stored in data structures. And that's how you look up stuff really quickly and do other operations really, quick, really quickly. I'm no expert, but I would say the speed of databases is what gives them the biggest advantage over using a file or something like that. But that's not to say that you should not use a file. That's really up for you to decide. Um, but generally speaking, the way, the way I like to think about it is that I'll, when I have lots of data that needs to be constantly manipulated and retrieved and stuff like that, I'll use a database because databases are really efficient for those types of things. And then for a file, if I, if I don't really have that much data that I'll be constantly grabbing and manipulating and storing back into the file, I'll probably just use a file for simple stuff. But it doesn't have to be simple. There are libraries out there that help you, you know, work with JSON files and JSON in general in Java, like JSON, the Jackson library. Um, so again, that's up to you. And also one final thing I forgot to put on the slide. Uh, another option is our persistent data containers. And persistent data containers are an abstraction uh, library within Spigot that label, enable you to store data within the MBT data of entities in Minecraft. I have a video on that if you're interested. They're really cool. They are another option to store data persistently, um, and they do, of course, use files behind the scenes. <laughs> Pretty much everything does, because that's how stuff is stored uh, persistently in computers. But for these next couple of videos, I'll obviously be showing you databases and focusing on that, but I do have videos on the other things. 
All right, so let's get into SQL specifically. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. Some people pronounce it SQL, but they um, they they have issues. Don't ever say SQL or um, just don't, okay? All right, so what is SQL? SQL is a standard language for communicating and doing things to a relational database. That's why it's called Structured Query Language. So when you're executing queries on a database, you're using SQL. Well, it depends on the database, but most relational databases that you hear of today are SQL databases. So it's how you talk to the database and get the database to do things, how to get data from the database, how to put data into the database, how to delete data, update data, all those kinds of things. Um, that's all with SQL, generally speaking. Uh, and so what is a relational database? So a relational database is made up of tables and rows in those tables that hold data of some type of entity. So for example, in Java, you have classes that you create to model certain types of entities, like a person or a cat or something like that. And so within those classes, you have fields like a cat's name, a cat's age, a cat's weight, all those kinds of things. So a way you can think of it is taking that Java class and mapping it to a table. And a table is as simple as it sounds. It's a simple table with columns and rows. And the columns are represented by each field of the class. So just like an Excel document, if you've ever seen Excel, um, that's a table. And I'll show you what a table looks like right here. So here's an example table. This is modeling something like a customer's table. So it's a table of customers. So each customer has each of these columns here. And each column is headed by whatever the attribute of the column is named, okay? So you can imagine this is a customer class that has all of these different fields. So customer ID, first name, last name, phone, number, email, street, city, state, zip code. And each of these have a value, but they don't have to have values. As you can see, they can also be null, just like Java values, which is really cool. So just don't overthink it. Tables are a really simple concept. And each row in the table represents a single entity, or in this case, with our analogy, a single Java object. All right, And we'll get plenty of experience working with these in the future. So I just want to emphasize that SQL is a standard, not something that's universally um, used in every single implementation of a relational database. It's a standard in the sense that these relational databases follow the standard, but they're not all the same. So each implementation of a SQL database have different dialects. So you may have heard of MySQL, that's the most popular form of uh, SQL databases. So that has its own uh, MySQL dialect versus something like a SQLite dialect or some other database name. They all have their little differences that make them sort of unique, but they also have their commonalities in them because it follows the SQL standard. And so it's a, I think it's called ANSI. It's an ANSI standard, the American National Scientific, I don't even know, I just made that up. So if that makes sense, just know that SQL is not the exact same everywhere that you find it, but they all have very, very core similarities. So if you were to write some basic SQL, you know, queries for a MySQL database, if it was very simple, it'd probably still work for an H2 database, which is another type of SQL database. So here's a list of just some of the popular SQL databases out there. MySQL is probably the one that everyone has heard of at least once. That's also the most popular one. And whenever people think of SQL, they also think of MySQL. So some people don't know that MySQL is not SQL itself. SQL is something that's used with the MySQL as the way to communicate with MySQL and also the standard that it follows. Then you have Post, Postgres. I don't know how to say that. PostgreSQL. I don't know how people say that. And then SQLite, My, Microsoft SQL Server, H2. H2 is one of my favorites. So in this series, we'll be using both MySQL and H2 separately. So I can show you both of those because they both have some really cool things in them. Uh, but you can play around with any of them if you wish. And generally speaking, it doesn't really matter which one you play with um, because, again, they have their similarities. So working with a SQL database in Java, obviously this is a Spigot series, so everything we're doing is in Java. So how do we do that? So Java is really cool because it has something called JDBC built directly into Java. You don't have to import any library. It's called Java Database Connectivity API. So it's a API built directly into Java, just like the other Java APIs, such as the string API, that allows you to directly work with the SQL databases. You can connect to the database and execute SQL queries upon that database directly within Java without any extra work. The only thing that you do have to import or worry about is the driver for that specific database implementation that you're using. So for example, if you want to use JDBC, and of course JDBC is just an API, 
you have to import the driver, the JDBC driver for, let's say, a MySQL database, right? So in this sense, JDBC is also a standard, just like SQL is a standard. So you can think of JDBC as an interface that provides the different methods that is offered by JDBC to allow you to work with a database. And then the different drivers that each of the database implementations provide are the implementation for those methods. But anyway, um, with JDBC, it's really low level. So you're directly writing SQL queries. You're crafting them from the bottom up and then running them against the database. But with other libraries that you can import, such as a object relational mapping library, um, there's some really cool ones out there that can take your Java objects and directly map them to SQL tables or queries. And you can also generate SQL code using, uh, well, magic. <laughs> I don't know how they do it, but they allow you to essentially provide a method a signature. And then behind the scenes, it'll automatically implement that in SQL uh, queries for you. And uh, it's really cool. But as just a starting point, we're gonna explore JDBC first because it's directly built into Java and also it's very good to understand the fundamentals of how to you know, create your own SQL queries and execute them on a database at a low level. And then from there, we'll work with the other cool libraries that allow us to do everything much, much more easy, easy easily, easier, easily. And uh, it's gonna be very, very fun. We're gonna explore a lot of different options. So here's an example of JDBC in action. So this is just, uh, so here we are creating a prepared statement, which is a way within JDBC to create a, JD, a SQL query. So we're doing an insertion query. So insert into the player status table, um, the following uh, fields. So UUID, deaths, kills, blocks broken, balance, last login, last logout. And then we're passing those in using these. So statement does a string, et cetera. This is setting the data within the, uh, the statement here, and then we're executing it onto the database, and then we're closing it to free up the memory. So it's just an example, it's kind of random, but I just wanted you to visualize what um, this actually looks like when we're using JDBC code. But again, we're gonna get lots of actual first-hand practice working with this, so don't worry if you have no idea what you're looking at. Oh yeah, before we go, I wanna give you an actual demonstration of what a MySQL database looks like. So I have a MySQL database uh, on my system locally currently. It's running right now along with a Apache server. That's just a web server. And so this provides to me a online web manager thingy. So it's called PHP MyAdmin. You may have heard of it. This allows you to view your database and also manipulate it and just look at the data within. So I have a, these are all the tables here that I have. Dog resort, blah, 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 my guitar shop. So I'm just gonna click on this database here and within this database, I have a bunch of uh, individual tables. So one of the tables is customers. So we click on that and we can see all of the data currently within the customers table. Let me just zoom in for you guys. And uh, yeah, so we got a bunch of things just as we saw in the example before. We got an ID, email address, password, uh, their hash passwords it looks like. So these are encrypted essentially. So you would never want to store a database directly unencrypted or hashed, that'd be naughty. Um, first name, last name, shipping address ID, uh, billing address ID, pretty cool stuff. And so each of these individual tables has a bunch of data. They're all different in the way that they store the data, or rather the data that they're modeling, excuse me. Um, but pretty cool stuff, right? And if you want to, you can directly manipulate the data within PHP My Admin. So that's pretty cool. So save, uh, boom, there you go. Yeah, pretty cool stuff, right? And it also gives you the code that it ran to update the database, which is really cool as well. But uh, yeah, anyway, I'll be showing you in the next episodes how to set up this here. I'll be showing you specifically how to set up a MySQL database on your computer locally, and then how to view it as we're viewing it right now on the interwebs and work with it and stuff like that. So if you wanna see that, hit that like button. And that's really it. Now you know um, what it means for data to be persistent and why we would wanna use databases or some other options. And you also know what SQL is now, hopefully better than you did before, and the different options for SQL, the different types of databases like MySQL, H2, SQLite, Oracle Server, or not Oracle, Microsoft Server, um, all those things. So some resources that I really like is Jankov JDBC Tutorials. He provides some really good tutorials on how to use JDBC within Java. So check out that link below in the description. And also another one is w3schools.com. Whenever I'm trying to figure out how to do something with an SQL, like how to create an SQL query to do some specific thing, like insert something into a database, I will use w3schools. That's like my number one reference. So I highly recommend this one as well. But yeah, if I miss anything guys, then please let me know in the comment section below. SQL databases and databases in general can be very overwhelming or scary or daunting at the beginning, but, but hopefully this introduction here gave you a better overview of what you're gonna be learning and uh, 
made you excited to learn it rather than maybe like worried about how difficult it is because that's that's at least how I felt when I first learned about these things but um now I have a little bit of experience working with these types of things so uh yeah stay tuned for the next episodes in this series where I'll be showing you how to make your first bigot plugin that communicates and uses a SQL database all right so that's it for this video thanks for watching in the description below I'll leave a link to the code for this episode so you can check it out you can bookmark it come back to it later if you forget any concepts or you just want to review the concepts I taught in this video, I'll mark everything up with comments so you can come back and read the code without having to rewatch the video, although your reviews are greatly appreciated. So yeah, I'll leave a link for that in the description below, so make sure to check it out. And another thing is I'll leave a link to our Discord server. It's a big community for programmers. You can ask for help on your programming projects if you're stuck on something, or maybe you can get some new friends. If you don't have any friends, there's lots of people here. It's growing really fast. You can, get, uh, you can find lots of people who are passionate about the same things as you. For example, if you like Minecraft uh, Spigot development, uh, you can find people, lots of people who like that. If you like C++, if you like Java, if you like web development, it's a really, really big programming community. So uh, feel free to join. There's a link for that in the description below. And the last thing I want to tell you is that if you want to support this channel, you can click the join button below this video and you can join this channel as a member for as low as 99 cents a month and you can cancel at any time. You get some cool perks like early access to all of my new videos, a cool rank on my Discord server like you see right here on the side, YouTube members, and also you get to see yourself on the screen like you see right now. So if that sounds cool to you, feel free to join. If you don't want to, that's fine. If you can't, that's okay too. Um, I really just uh, appreciate you watching the video anyway. And uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. And that's it. So if you like this video, leave a like. If you want to see more, subscribe. And peace.